to a debate on motion 10214 in the name of Christina McKelvey on making the most of equalities and human rights levers. I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Christina McKelvey to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. A hundred years ago today, the Representation of People's Act gave some women the vote, provided they were aged over 30 and either they or their husband met a property qualification. Oddly, I noticed they couldn't bring themselves to refer to women in the long title of the Act. Clearly, we were lumped in with the other purposes connected here with paragraph. But 100 years on and the progress made is apparent and I'm speaking here as an elected member of the Scottish Parliament and convener of the Equalities and Human Rights <coughs> Committee. We have a women first minister, a second female prime minister and there are countless women leading businesses and standing up for their rights and the rights of others. I'd like to pay tribute to two such women, Emma Rich of Engender and Angela O'Hagan, a lecturer at Caledonian University, who have helped the committee's understanding of the impact of public policy on women and made the case for gender budgeting. But I can't help thinking more could have been achieved in that time, those 100 years. And if we fast forward to the next 100 years and look back, what will we have, what, 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 what will we have achieved? Will society truly be more equal, not just for women, but for for other underrepresented groups. We can't afford to be complacent, presiding officer, and I recognise members will be by now a bit budget weary. And I hope today's debate re-energises members and brings focus to the fundamental need for equalities and human rights to be the starting point for budget setting and budget scrutiny. And the ongoing public discourse about sexual harassment and equal pay serves as a timely rem reminder that we must keep pushing forward. More can and needs to be done and to make, our, to make our society fairer, where everyone is respected and treated with some dignity. Without women standing up and being heard, would addressing gender inequality to enhance economic growth be at the top of the agenda at the World Economic Forum held in Davos recently? I really don't think so. But today I want to draw the Parliament's attention to the committee's report on making the most of our equalities and human rights levers. By making the most of these tools, we can be more assured that there will be less disconnect between public policy making, the resource allocation and stated outcomes. I'd like to say a special thank you to all the witnesses who came along and shared their experiences with us, particularly around the inequality faced by the black, Asian and minority ethnic population in Scotland and those who provided written evidence. And at this point, to the clerks, Spice and everyone else who helped us understand some of the technicalities. I'm glad to say Scotland has been at the forefront of equality budgeting and it is with this in mind that I couch the rest of my remarks this afternoon. We are of course keen to welcome the Scottish Government's increased budget for promoting equality. This £22.7 million the Government has told us will be used amongst other things to resource frontline services to tackle domestic violence against women and girls, address social isolation and loneliness, strengthen community cohesion and address discrimination and inequality across all of the protected characteristics. The budget is a financial reflection of government policy. It displays the Scottish Government's values and priorities. It is important therefore that the equality budget statement informs that budget setting rather than being a post hoc exercise. And I'm pleased that the Budget Process Review Group recognised this and that the Scottish Government has committed to work with the Equality uh, Budget Advisory Group to improve the equality assessment of the budget process. Presiding Officer, in the time I have, I have left, I'd like to focus on three core areas which featured in our report. One, mainstreaming of equalities and its continued importance. Two, the public sector equality duty and its value in gathering data to inform budget setting in times of budgetary challenge. And three, human rights and what this means in terms of allocating resources. Mainstreaming, as we know, has been a buzzword since the 1990s. Some greet the term with a sigh, while others say we already do that. Mainstreaming of equalities is a continuous journey, it's not a destination. And I'd like to reconnect members today with what mainstreaming means. Why we can't lose sight of its transformative, transformative impact on equality. 
Mainstreaming is about better decision making and implementation. It allows for better policy, reflecting the diversity of different groups to affect change. It's about increased awareness of diversity and needs, creating change in the culture of an organisation and society to be more open to diversity and to differences. It's also about social inclusion and cohesion. It ensures that all groups and individuals within society are duly served in the provision of public services and care and are represented within that society. And it's also about prevention because consideration of discriminated against groups takes place at the time of decision making, preventing discrimination from occurring in the first place. Presiding officer, we recognise the substantial progress the Scottish Government has made in mainstreaming and welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to us to further improve mainstreaming within the Scottish Government. It would be helpful if the Cabinet Secretary could share with us today what outcomes the Scottish Government has set for mainstreaming up to 2021 and how these translate into resource allocation. I think we could all agree that embracing mainstreaming throughout an organisation can have a transformational effect and help to inform those difficult budget decisions and make them a bit more transparent. The public sector equality duty underpins mainstreaming and it has the potential to unlock a rich seam of equality's data to improve that decision making. The duties propose is the duty's purpose is to ensure that public authorities and those carrying out public functions consider how they can positively contribute to a more equal society through advancing equality and good relations in their day-to-day -day business. To deliver improved outcomes for all, in doing so, public bodies, bodies should have due regard to the need to eliminate unlawful discrimination, harassment and victimisation and other prohibited conduct, advance the quality of opportunity between people who share a relevant protected characteristic and those who do not, foster good relationships between people who share a protected characteristic and those who do not. These are collectively known as the three needs. The committee expressed some concern in its report that local authorities may not be incorporating equalities into their budget setting process in a consistent manner and it intends to write in the first instance to those local authorities. We appreciate the Scottish Government's willingness to share what it has learned from its work on equalities in budget setting and to learn from other public bodies. This approach is warmly welcomed by the committee. We keenly await the Equality and Human Rights Commission's review of the public sector equality duty expected in the spring and that should help inform our way forward. But we also know that the Cabinet Secretary responds to a report that it will be conducting a review of the implementation of the Equality Act 2010, the specific duties Scotland Regulations 2012, and they'll be doing that this year. It would be helpful if the Cabinet Secretary could provide some further detail on what form this review will take. We would also be happy to share the information we receive about equalities and local authorities' budget setting processes with the Scottish Government to help inform the review. Finally, Presiding Officer, I want to discuss briefly human rights and its integration into the budget setting process. This is of particular importance given the UK is a signatory to a number of United Nations treaties. The committee has put its efforts into exploring this development and raising awareness about this concept. We believe it is important to the progressive realisation of human rights and to ensuring that no rollback of rights in times of budgetary constraint happens. This is a state obligation for no regression. Regression would mean immediate action has to be taken, budgetary decisions as they relate to human rights need to be monitored. To show my commitment, I am attending a human rights budgeting masterclass tomorrow morning and I would be happy to share my new knowledge with any member who is interested in learning more. We have heard from Judith Robertson, the chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, who using the panel principles are important for getting budget decisions right for those who are not au fait with the principles they are participation, accountability, non-discrimination, empowerment and legality. And Judith underlines their importance to us when she said, and I quote, if we get the approach right in relation to people who are the most vulnerable, everyone will benefit. We would like to see the Scottish Government lead that way and adopt a national direction on human rights budgeting. Imp implementing a national framework for human rights based budgeting would keep Scotland leading in this field. And I hope members today will agree with me that incorporating equalities in human rights and meeting people's needs makes good business and societal sense. And I move the motion in my name on behalf of the Equality and Human Rights Committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. How long do I have? 
Thank you. Um, can I start with saying, President Officer, that ensuring that the budget tackles inequality in Scotland uh, is indeed a key priority uh, for the Scottish Government, and I am pleased to discuss both their achievements uh, but also uh, areas for further improvement. I also want to extend my thanks to the Quality and Human Rights Committee for their recent report uh, entitled Making the Most of Equalities and Human Rights Levers in Developing the Budget. And I have discussed this report at committee and have also responded in writing. For the past uh, nine years, the Scottish Government has undertaken equality analysis and assessment and crucially published this alongside the draft budget in the Equality Budget Statement. Few countries in the world, if any, do the assessment that Scotland does uh, right across uh, the full range of protected characteristics. And I very warmly welcome the, the cross-party uh, constructive uh, scrutiny into this statement. As in previous years, the Scottish Government has been supported in the equality budget process uh, with the equality budget advisory group. And again, I'd like to put my record uh, of thanks uh, to the members uh, of the Quality Budget Advisory Group for their insight, uh, for their expertise, but also uh, for the challenge that they bring. And in this regard, uh, I would also like to thank the Parliament's Budget Process Review Group uh, for their very careful consideration uh, of the budgetary processes uh, and for their support uh, to continued equality analysis uh, of the budget. As acknowledged by the Budget Process Review Group, the Scottish Government has made significant advances in equality assessment. And I would just like to mention some of the recent improvements, particularly in response to the convener of the committee's opening remarks. We already provide measurement of outcomes through the national performance framework, with key indicators being published alongside the draft budget. And a review of these national outcomes and national indicators is currently underway. And a fundamental aim of that review is to ensure that tackling inequality underpins the revised framework. And we are aiming to, to break down as many of the national indicators as possible by both the protected equality characteristic and by inequalities in terms of deprivation and place. And we've also started to publish analysis of how budgetary decisions uh, will impact on people across the income spectrum uh, or across protected characteristics also. And a recent income tax discussion paper uh, presented distributional analysis associated with example income tax changes and on draft budget day we updated this analysis uh, published in a paper uh, on the impact of the income tax proposals uh, in the draft budget and the analysis uh, is provided for different income groups uh, but it is then extended uh, to assess the impact of the income tax policy uh, on age, gender and uh, disability. So, for example, that analysis showed that 44% of women uh, pay tax uh, and of these female income tax payers, 79% will pay less income tax in 2018-19 than in 2017-18. However, when we look at this uh, in the round, uh, this is in part uh, reflects a, a lower waged uh, economy for women and the greater prevalence uh, of part-time work uh, to enable caring. So we need to be looking at all these statistics in the round, always scratching beneath the surface, looking below the headline statistics and looking at what it really means, uh, particularly in the real world and in the day-to-day -day lives, in this case, uh, for women. Last year, President Officer, we also published a report on mainstreaming equality in the Scottish Government. Uh, and working with stakeholders, we set out a, a new suite of equality outcomes for 2017 to 2021. And these outcomes build on a, a wide range of policies developed and implemented uh, over the past few years to drive forward equality, including the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, the Race Equality Framework, the Race Equality Action Plan, uh, a Fairer Scotland for Disabled People, the Equally Safe Strategy for the Prevention of Violence Against Women and Girls, uh, and the, the Fair Work Framework. And I believe that the Scottish Government has already shown its commitment uh, to demonstrating leadership uh, on human rights and the recently established First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights has been asked to make recommendations to ensure uh, that Scotland continues to lead by example in human rights 
And as part of this work, we will welcome advice from the group on how to further demonstrate budgetary commitment to human rights across all portfolios in the Scottish Government. So, President Officer, there's been a lot of action, but we are not complacent. We know that there is always space to further develop and articulate our equality assessment of the budget. And we are committed to work with the Equality Budget Advisory Group to seek improvements and indeed uh, this work has already started. Uh, meetings uh, with officials took place before Christmas and just yesterday my colleague the Cabinet Secretary for Finance uh, and the Constitution uh, met members to discuss the recommendations uh, of the budget process uh, review group whose recommendations uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance has accepted. Uh, for my part I'll be following this up when I, I meet the group later this month uh, once discussions have progressed, uh, I will certainly uh, provide the Equalities and Human Rights Committee uh, with details uh, about our forward plans, uh, as I have committed to do uh, with regard to this and uh, many other matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Annie Wells, to be followed by James Kelly. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the pursuit of equality across all government portfolios, from justice to health to education, <clears throat> the draft budget has been accompanied by the, an equality budget statement for the last nine years. With the Budget Process Review Group publishing an independent report last year calling for equality dimensions of the budget to become an even greater priority, I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak today on the recommendations of the committee report and also to hear from the Scottish Government what actions it will take to further shape its equality approach to the budget. Scotland has much to celebrate when it comes to equality, and I only have to look to the collaborative work done by the Equality and Human Rights Committee and the Education Committee last year on prejudice-based bullying to see what the impact putting equality at the forefront of policy ambition can have. For all the positives, however, I hope to see the Scottish Government take forward some of the committee report's recommendation when it comes to budget setting process. To make the most of the equalities and human rights levers, we need to see mainstreaming accountability and improvement and informed use of data. As we heard during the evidence sessions from Dr. Angela O'Hagan of Glasgow Caledonian's Wise Research Centre, while Scotland has been a pioneer over the years, progress has been hindered by the disconnect that exists between positive discourse and its implementation in spending departments. It was frequently expressed that equality mainstreaming was not yet routine across the portfolios and that spending should be planned and proactive. It was felt that the equality budget statement should have systematic considerations of no, to no long-term issues, working ahead of them rather than in reaction to them. Using the example highlighted during the evidence sessions, if we are aware there are around 15,000 wheelchair users in Scotland, and that ethnic minorities are four times more likely to be in overcrowded housing, it makes business sense to, to resolve such issues in the context of the wider government ambition to build 50,000 affordable homes. Paramount to this, of course, is the need to work within budget realities, whilst being transparent about how equalities funding is allocated, at least in some part within departments. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Elizabeth. Thank you, President. <coughs> Officer. Thank Annie Wells for taking the intervention. But um, I wonder if she would agree with me that those affordable homes should be wheelchair accessible. Annie Wells. Thank you. Um, yes, I think we should look at what, what we need to do because we know that to, to adapt homes at the moment is it's dearer than actually making them ready for, for purpose. So I agree that we, we should look at that. On doing so, um, so that full budget scrutiny can be carried out. Furthermore, in any attempt to fully mainstream equalities within the budget process, there needs to be a concerted effort to move the onus away from solely the equality unit and to make it the responsibility of government department leaders to ensure that equality-based policies are working. As an example of this, Chris Oswald of the Equalities and Human Rights Commission highlighted the 2014 apprenticeship scheme, which was felt to have missed the great opportunity in recruiting people with disabilities and those from ethnic minority backgrounds. 
Underpinning this more strategic approach, of course, is the need to continually improve the data that is available so that priority areas can be routinely highlighted, something that was a long-standing issue for the former Equal Opportunities Committee. It is absolutely crucial that Scotland creates a robust database according to protected characteristics for the purpose of analysis, scrutiny, and ensuring that resources are targeted most effectively. It is then we can use data to our advantage and improve the pathway between evidence, policy, and spend. Of course, the equality evidence strategy does already exist, but as the committee report suggests, it would be helpful over time to hear more about, in, more about on how gaps will be prioritised and what specific projects will be set up. To finish today, I would also like to thank the committee clerks and SPICE and all associated with the committee and those who gave evidence to inform this committee's report. As we have heard from the report, it is vital in putting equality at the forefront of the budget, that we take a business-like approach to implementing equality frames across government departments, so that this priority can become part and parcel of everyday decision-making. To do so, we need to identify priority areas with the help of improved data in relation to protected characteristics, target resources strategically, and make honest assessments of what is and what isn't having an impact. Only in doing this can we achieve a fairer Scotland. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. I now call on James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And it, it gives me pleasure to open the debate on behalf of Scottish Labour and this important uh, committee report on making the most of the equality and human rights uh, levers. And can I place on record uh, my thanks to the committee staff, the MSPs, um, and all involved in putting in place uh, such an important body of work. In summary, uh, what the report, I think, is, is seeking to try and do is to take forward the work that has been done in relation to equalities in the budget uh, and to make more progress and to give much greater priority to a human rights-based uh, approach to budgeting. Um, I, mean, I think that is uh, that's correct for a number of reasons. I think it, 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 establishing equalities in human rights as part of your budget process is not only the right and fair thing to do, but ultimately will, will be, not just benefit the process, but will benefit the community in the longer run. Um, because if you look at the, the number of stakeholders and budget holders that are involved in the process, if you can ensure that there's an, an equality in human rights uh, based approach across all that, uh, then you will have a much joined up budgeting, appro uh, budgeting process and that only will, will not only ensure that you deliver a more fair approach but ultimately I believe will actually save uh, the government money in the longer run. Sure. Jamie Green. Thanks James Kelly for uh, taking the bench. And how does he think that central government uh, can play a role in ensuring that local authorities and local councils are also implementing uh, equality policies. James Kelly. Um, well, I think ultimately the, the responsibility for local authority budgets uh, rests with local authorities. So I accept the points that have been made that local authorities need to uh, step up and do more. But I think there's a leadership role there for central government uh, in order that they ensure that uh, in terms of local authority budget processes, they take more responsibility in embedding uh, equalities and human rights approaches within local authority budget processes. I think in terms of the, 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 the processes, um, it's important to uh, understand that there's, there's a good element of uh, transparency. And I think in doing that, the, the collection of data is absolutely critical because if we're, uh, if we're going to be able to understand properly the impact of decisions that we make and whether they uh, properly give right priority to equalities in human rights, then we need to be able to not only collect the data but publish the data and make it available in a form that's understandable to everyone that's involved in the budget process, not just the, the accountants that uh, draw up the budget. I think there's a couple of interesting areas that the, the committee draws attention to. 
Uh, I think more can be done in relation to procurement and capital investment. Uh, the government spends billions of pounds uh, each year in this area in, it, in its budget. And I think not only can the processes be simplified, but more can be done to draw out to ensure that there are qualities and a, a proper sort of human, human rights approach there. I think the other area that the committee draws attention to that of interest is that of ring fencing. There's always a, a tension in relation to local authority budgets as to what money should be ring fenced. And there's a, a, I suppose there's a, a natural move at a local authority level to have more flexibility and therefore to, to, to resist ring fencing. But I think if you want to be serious about uh, introducing more equalities approaches, then you need to, to be looking more seriously at ring fencing. I think the other point that needs to be made is this all needs to be taken in the overall context of the, the, the budget. The budget that is before us currently comes on the back of £1.5 billion of cuts to local councils. And the Women's Budget Group tells us that the majority uh, of users and providers uh, are women. So the, the budget that's before us, I don't believe, you know, serves equalities and human rights and women uh, to the best of its ability. I think if you really want to tackle austerity, if you want to redistribute power and redistribute wealth, we need to be doing much more in terms of the powers that are available within the parliament. So in summing up, uh, presiding officer, I think the, the committee report makes an, some important contributions in terms of the process, but we need to also be de de uh, dealing with the overall politics and allocations of the budget if we're serious about making the most of the levers that are available to us in terms of equality and human rights. Thank you very much. We now enter the open part of the debate. I call Gail Ross to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I would like to start by thanking everyone that gave evidence to our Committee on Budget Scrutiny and how we're doing in Scotland with regards to equalities and human rights. I would also like to thank the Clarks, Spice and my fellow committee members for all their hard work in producing this report. And like the convener, I also welcome the increase in equality funding in the budget. We touched on several aspects of the budget and discussed several different portfolios, including education, health, housing, planning, justice, and local government. And we can be in no doubt as to the importance of working with organizations and individuals that have experience in this field, such as the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, the Scottish Women's Convention, Engender, BEMIS, the Council of Ethnic Minority Voluntary or Sector Organisations, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, the Equality and Budgetary Advisory Group, and the WISE Research Centre, who all gave evidence. Human rights is a new remit for our committee, and the first time that a single committee has had this remit in the Scottish Parliament. But, presiding officer, human rights should not just be the remit of our committee, it should form the basis of every policy across every portfolio and underpin every decision we make. And there is no starker example of this than in the budget. There was some concern expressed by witnesses that although equalities in human rights are considered in some aspects, they don't already underpin our budget process to a large enough extent. We are doing very well in some areas and we could improve in others. And there was a view that equalities can sometimes be looked at in a retrospective manner rather than being at the forefront of decision making. Dr. Angela O'Hagan of WISE believed equalities in human rights budgeting should activate mainstreaming so that spending allocations and revenue decisions are integrated. She emphasized that committees when scrutinizing and policy makers when formulating proposals needed to ask whether a policy or legal intervention will advance equality and realization of rights. In their joint submission to us, Glasgow Council for the Voluntary Sector, the Scottish Council on Deafness, Scottish Voluntary Action and Volunteer Glasgow said, an explicit statement and a distinct methodology on human rights must underpin the process and evidence gathered to monitor impact in the short, medium and longer term. Chris Oswald of the EHRC stated that human rights analysis was largely absent from the budget he said, there is a government framework around disabled people's rights and independent living, but it is entirely predicated on the delivery by local authorities. 
health and other agencies, which are rightly independent of government. However, there is no checking. Local authority budgeting in particular has to focus more on equalities and human rights. Things like removal of concessionary bus fares, reductions in grants to the third sector, closure of play parks and reduction in budgets for vulnerable adults are just a few of the proposals from some local authorities that are questionable in these terms. So one of the key recommendations that the committee makes is this. The Scottish Government's leadership in this key area of activity would prove to be an exemplar for other public authorities facing difficult budget decisions. We believe that adopting a national direction on human rights based budgeting would demonstrate that meeting people's needs makes good business sense. In an environment where there are financial constraints, a human rights framework can provide objective guidance which will assist balanced decision making on the use of resources and importantly limit the extent and duration of any retrogression. Presiding officer, we have to take equalities and human rights into account when we make all our decisions in this chamber and I welcome the remarks by the Cabinet Secretary in her opening. I note the commitment in the programme for government to establish an expert advisory group to make decisions on how Scotland can lead by example in human rights, including economic, social, cultural and environmental rights. I look forward to our committee working with the Scottish Government and the other committees on this issue. I commend the report to the Chamber and I look forward to the convener's feedback from her workshop tomorrow. Thank you. Alexandra Stewart, followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to be able to take part in today's debate on the findings and recommendations of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on the report published ahead of the draft budget in December. And may I take the opportunity, as others have already, to add my thanks to the members of the committee for putting together this report. I am not a member of the committee, but I do applaud the work that they have done so far. In particular today, I would like to focus on the report's comments on local authorities. As the report itself states, given the autonomous nature of local authorities, it can sometimes be difficult to ensure what national policy priorities be implemented at a local level. It gives a number of examples where the aims of certain pieces of legislation, such as the Children and Young People's Act or the Community Empowerment Act, have not been fully realised at local authorities and have, in many cases, decided not to fund these policies fully. While I recognise that this may frustrate some people, Deputy Prime Officer, I'm glad that the report does not insist on ring fencing as the solution to this problem in all cases, but rather suggests that the merits of such approaches are done by a case-by-case -case basis. It is a difficult balance to strike between ensuring the Scottish Government's equalities agenda is delivered on a local level and prioritise the independence of local authorities to determine how they spend their budgets. While some local authorities may pay less emphasis on equalities in the absence of ring fencing measures, others may come up with new initiative ways of addressing issues in different manners. I therefore believe it's important that we try not to be too rigid or restrictive when we are allocating funds to local councils. The report also highlights the fact that the Equality Act is a single entity on the public sector. This requires all public bodies to give due consideration to the needs of those individuals with protected characteristics, both within their own organisation and within what they might be delivering to. There are, however, some concerns as to whether the duty is being met. The Equalities and Human Acts Right Commissioner said that budgetary issues in the public sector are rarely examined in detail through the lenses of the duties, and the Council for ethnic minority voluntary sector organisations given to the Scottish Government budget use to fund a variety of public bodies. It is virtually impossible to measure its impact on the PSED. While this of course continues, it is again not necessarily a justification for greater ministerial oversight of the direction of local authority spending in it of itself that are there uh, of tackling the problem and the issue. And within the report, Rebecca Marrick from the Coalition of Le Racial Equalities and Rights makes what I think is a very valid point that the lack of utilising equalities evidence to set spending priorities is much more severe at local authority level. While some authorities take the duty very seriously, Ms Marrick is right to suggest that others should 
evaluate all the evidence on equalities available to them when sending their budgets and spending their budgets and looking at what they can do to ensure that the service provision is provided. On the basis of this, I think the committee is absolutely correct to see that the public sector uh, is looking at the way uh, of how it enables that rather than having a tick box exercise in this process. I would also like to commend the committee's plans to write to local authorities to ask them how they will consider equalities information when determining their spending priorities. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, it is of course very important that politicians are mindful of equalities and human rights during the budget setting process and that it give due consideration to the impact of the decisions that might have on minority groups in particular. This applies equally to local level when we are considering how budgets should be set, but it's also very relevant for us here in Holyrood. We should lead by example in the Scottish Parliament and encourage local authorities to do the same. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Mary Fee, followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate. And can I start by thanking my fellow committee members, the committee clerks, and all the witnesses who gave evidence to the committee during our evidence sessions. Deputy Presiding Officer, the budget process is the single most important act of government each and every parliamentary year. And the budget process should be fully transparent. It should be possible to trace the budget process from its inputs through to its outputs, its real impact on people's lives, because that is the only way we can measure the effectiveness of the drivers that government should be using to tackle inequality. And taking a human rights approach is key to making the budget process fairer. We should be doing more to ensure that human rights are at the heart of our political debate. And I'd like to see human rights at the forefront of all politicians' minds when devising budget and formulating legislation. And if we truly wish to have a society which is caring, diverse, inclusive of all, and more equal, then we must prioritise human rights issues during the scrutiny of our budget. A critical driver in tackling inequality is embedding equality impact assessments in all work that national and local governments do. And despite the United Kingdom being a signatory to a range of United Nations human rights treaties, consideration of human rights issues is not at the forefront of the, the Scottish budget process. And the following example was highlighted by Chris Oswald of the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. And he told committee that in the case of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, to which the UK is a signatory, it outlines a commitment to independent living for all persons with disabilities. However, at present, this commitment to independent living for disabled people is not reflected in the Scottish Government's housing and transport budget allocations and policy despite these being two key areas which are significant barriers to disabled people's active inclusion and participation in Scottish society. And a human rights approach should be fundamental to everything that we do. And if we get the process of adopting a human rights approach to the budget correct, then most importantly, this will protect the most vulnerable people in our society. And in doing so, it benefits us all. The importance of a more equal society cannot be underestimated. A more equal society is a happier society and a more trusting society. And consistently, the European countries which are ranked as the happiest, the happiest by the World Happiness Survey, are those with the lowest levels of inequality. And for example, Denmark has been ranked as the world's happiest country for three of the last five years. And I appreciate that no country provides a perfect example of the implementation of human rights or the adoption of a human rights approach. However, Denmark does provide an illuminating example of the benefits of a more equal society. Denmark is one of the most egalitarian and trusting societies in the world. And its population's trust in its government, in its politicians, and in their fellow citizens ranks amongst the highest 
in the world. And in coming to a close, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I reiterate my support for the Equalities and Human Rights Committee's call for discussions around human rights and the Scottish Government's budget to be expedited. Adopting a human rights and equality-based approach to the Scottish budget are vital as it would go some way to reducing inequality in Scotland by protecting our most vulnerable citizens and in doing so would help to create a more equal, happier and trusting Scotland. Thank you. Patrick Harvey, followed by David Torrance. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also thank the committee for bringing this debate to the Chamber. I first suggested to the Government, uh, to the, the Minister for Parliamentary Business, that as part of the budget process, part of the budget scrutiny process, there ought to be some time in the Chamber on, on Government time to debate uh, the equalities aspects and, and in particular the, the gender uh, analysis aspects of the, the budget. I, I think having a committee debate instead of a government debate is probably helpful, probably a, a better approach because debates in government time with, with motions and amendments and votes at decision time inevitably bring this into the uh, you know, yes it is, no it isn't uh, arguments around the budget. And what I think is needed here is some reflection on where we've got to on why we made the progress that we did, which Angela Constance spoke about, the, the approach that's been taken on equalities impact assessments of the budget and why that's been good uh, as it has been, but also on why it hasn't continued to improve. Uh, and I think we need to be uh, honest about that. In particular, I'm, I'm relying, as, as other members are, a great deal today uh, on the evidence given by Dr. Angela O'Hagan, uh, who said, while acknowledging a great deal that's positive, she also said in her, in her written submission, this draft budget, like budgets before it, lacks gender competence. And I think in that one phrase, uh, we do need to recognise that there are serious criticisms of what we've got. Why, why has that happened? Why have we made this progress toward good use of equality impact assessments, but then not gone further and started to construct budgets with equalities and human rights as guiding principles rather than assessments after the fact. I think it has something to do with the sharply constrained timescale that we have for budget process now. I was looking back at a previous year, uh, back in, in my first session as, a, as an MSP, uh, and the Finance Committee at that time had its approach paper on the budget process in mid-June followed by a, an expectation that the executive, as, as the government was called then, would publish a draft budget uh, in mid-September. And by November, all of the parliamentary committees had had time to look at the draft budget, the numbers, not just broad brushstrokes, report to the Finance Committee, feedback to the government, uh, and for the government to respond to all of that. Months of proper, in-depth budget scrutiny was normal and compare that to what we have this year and last for different reasons for understandable reasons draft budgets being published in december and a very tight time scale for scrutinizing government proposals i think it's that long-term budget scrutiny that allows the development of new ideas like how can we do equalities impact assessments better and I think if we were still taking our time over budget scrutiny, we would have led uh, from there onto the, the, the arguments that Angela O'Hagan and others argue for so convincingly that equalities and human rights need to be in the starting point of, of the budget process as the government develops its budget rather than just get better at assessing the equalities impacts after the budget has been Produced. Now, the, the Cabinet Secretary, to be fair, I put some of those points to him during our constrained budget scrutiny process in committee this year, and he agreed uh, that we need to get a lot better at this. So I hope uh, that uh, Mr Mackay will be closing for the government in the debate, and I hope he'll be able to say specifically what it is that's going to be done differently in future. I certainly give way to the... Bruce Finance Crawford... Excuse me, Mr. Crawford, your microphone's not on. You don't have your card in. <laughs> Bruce Crawford. Sorry, President Officer, I just did a Harvey. 
because they, they said that about somebody else last week, signing <laughs> officer. I wonder, Mr. Har Mr. Harvey, agree with me though, uh, despite all the points you just made, that the budget process review group, which has been undertaking a significant part of work in reviewing the budget process, uh, whether that's the mid-term financial strategy or other mechanisms employed as part of that process, will considerably help the budget process. Patrick Harvey. I, I certainly share that hope. I certainly share that hope. There's a great deal of work to be done uh, to, to turn that, that objective into a reality, and I think we all share that. If I can make a couple of brief uh, comments just before closing to bring this to some of the specifics that we've heard. For example, we have a, a great deal of uh, emphasis on capital expenditure, on that as a stimulus for the economy, as something that will create jobs. And yet what we know from the evidence is that investment in social infrastructure, care services, for example, generates more employment, not only generates more employment, but ensures that there is a more positive gender impact and social class impact in the, in the question of who it is gets the benefit of that economic activity that's generated. Secondly, when we talk about economic activity and inactivity, uh, as uh, again the, the Women's Budget Group have, have said, there is a persistence, they say, in referring to women as economically inactive uh, and not recognising the economic relevance uh, of work which is not part of the paid employed labour market. Uh, I hope that these are areas where we can not only do better at assessing the equalities and gender impact and human rights impact of budgets once we've set them, but actually take these principles into the budget formation process. And it's government that needs to take up that opportunity. And I think if Parliament can allow more time in future for the scrutiny process, then we will be in a stronger position to place that expectation on government to take what we've done well in the past but not rest on our laurels uh, and, and take new ideas forward. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from David Torrance. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to first thank the clerk, Spice and everyone who gave evidence to the committee, as well as my fellow committee members for their hard work in drafting the report. Looking ahead to the Scottish Government's draft budget, making the most of equalities and human rights levers. I am proud to be a member of this committee in one of the world's leading countries in regards to progress in human rights commitments. And I welcome the Scottish Government's response to the report's findings. Provision of equality should be at the heart of all government policies and decision-making mechanisms. It should take into account the demands of all groups in our society. Government budgets are crucial for financing human rights and equality measures as they are set the stage for future policy developments and potential progress. The Scottish Government has worked hard to take an active role in integrating an equality discourse into our legislation and to ensure that the appropriate implement implementation. This is a crucial aspect of a democratic society and must be applied at all levels of government. Our goals remain clear. We want to raise awareness of the equality issues of government budgets, such as those surrounding issues of gender, race, sexual orientation, mental and physical disability, age, education, work, living standards, health, justice and participation in civil society. We seek to increase government accountability to raise the importance of the impacts of budgets on equality and we want to improve the budget allocations to foster equality. Despite our progress over the last few decades, we must make improvements to implementation and accountability of government budgets and its impact on equality. Our capacity for changing relationships of, of equality are not necessarily restricted to a government's wallet, but involve a wider social, social, society change. While we must continue to work with other stakeholders, we must recognise that the Scottish Government plays a leading role in promoting a more equal future. I have high hopes that the findings of the report being discussed today will open the door for the changes needed to promote equality. One of the main challenges we face, not just as a committee, but as a government, is ensuring that hours of evidence we take is translated into meaningful and practical policy. The report emphasises obstacles, highlighting the national performance indicators for monitoring and evaluating evidence as a means of overcoming some of the challenges we face. Evaluating evidence is essential for assessing progress and understanding where our challenges lie and achieving equality. However, as the report qualifies, quantifying evidence that is ultimately quantitative is in itself a huge challenge, and we must foster partnerships with, no, with other relevant stakeholders such as NGOs and human rights groups to ensure the emotional evidence given at our committee meetings are not only taken seriously, but translated into meaningful legislation. 
and I appreciate the Scottish Government's commitment to helping us achieve this. Over the last year, we have heard evidence from a range of equality and human rights groups, such as the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, the Council of Ethnic Minorities, Voluntary Sector Organisations and the Scottish Women's Convention, to name just a few. It is clear from these evidence sessions that there is a great room for progress. We need to create political infrastructure to establish the capacity and power for budget setting standards. We must monitor the impact of progress by including a wider range of stakeholders as well as improving accountability and scrutiny. We must set an example for other public institutions facing similar challenges and actively engage in our political and economic civil society to develop policy for an equality perspective. We must pay attention to international human laws and ensure that the Scottish standards are in line with the international community. In conclusion, President Officer, I'd once again like to thank the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for engagement with assessing the potential improvements to the Scottish budget. While I praise the progress we have made, I also look forward to future improvements. We cannot afford to miss any opportunities to tackle inequality, and we must start with the government's budget to ensure that adequate funding is allocated to political opportunities for those impacted by inequality. We must support an inclusive economic growth, community empowerment and civil society participation participation in order to hear the voices of those marginalised. We must recognise that, that integrating equality in our government budget is a multifaceted process that requires a holistic approach and in line with the report we need to continue to put equality at the forefront of budget setting process. We now move to the closing speeches and I call Rhoda Grant for around four minutes please Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think there was universal agreement that more needs to be done um, to make sure that the budget is equality proofed. We've been talking about this for years, ever since the Parliament first sat, but we appear to be no further forward. Mary Fee pointed out that the happiest countries are those that promote human rights and equalities, and therefore we all gain by having an equal society. And we need to start that equal society through the budget. Human rights was a theme that ran through the debate uh, this afternoon. But in, with declining resources, the, service, the services that help deliver human rights are the things that are being cut. People with disabilities need assistance to access the things that we all take for granted and enjoyed. But charging for services is, is, is increasing faster than inflation due to cuts in council budgets. And this has issues about, for people's dignity. Elaine Smith's intervention about new homes and how they should all be accessible, I think, helps to, us to see how we can build in equality into our everyday work and planning. Women are, for the most part, service users and indeed service providers. Women have caring responsibilities, and Patrick Harvey pointed out that we may need to place a greater value and indeed interrogate the value of that unpaid work. But as charges increase, um, service, um, services are being cut, and that has an impact on women as well. They are also those that provide services, often in the low-paid jobs. For instance, two-thirds of local, the local government workforce are women and they are the ones that have experienced redundancies and indeed long-term pay freezes and this is a big impact on their income. We heard before um, from on different reports that disabled people are now the new council taxpayers because due to their dependence on services they, they are paying more. The cuts to council budgets therefore are de detrimental to equalities and it creates much a much more unequal society and we need to address this. We also need to address race inequality. Um, there is a race equality framework and an action plan was published at the end of last year. But looking at the action plan, it's not very clear what the outcomes will be and indeed how they will be measured. What does success look like for that action plan? We talk about developing tools to assess all those things, but we've been talking about it for a long time, and they are desperately required now. I, Angela Constance talked about inequalities analysis and deprivation 
with, with regard to place. And this is something that I've been exercised about for some time because the indicators that we use to identify deprivation very often ignore rural deprivation. Things like car ownership are seen as a measure of wealth, not as a measure of necessity in rural areas. James Kelly talked about procurement and the need for this to be used to provide services that promote equality, but they should also be used to ensure that jobs are available for those with the protected characteristics, who also tend to be those that have less access to the workforce. So by using procurement for this purpose, I think we could go a long way. Presiding officer, Mary Fee said, we need to track inputs through outputs, and I think this is really important because mainstream mainstreaming equalities through the budget process is desirable, but it needs to be measurable and we need the tools to interrogate it. No real progress has been made on this and we need action now. I call Jamie Green. Around four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate and I'd like to thank my colleagues on the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for helping put together this report and for all those who gave uh, evidence to us. I'd also like to add my thanks to the opening words of our convener, Christina McKelvey. In the very short time that I've got today, I'd like to reflect on some of the specific findings of the report and perhaps summarize some of the points that I've taken away from today's brief debate. Um, I'd like to uh, comment specifically on the issue that James Kelly mentioned around capital investment projects and how they could be used by government to tackle inequality. In my view, this is a two-pronged uh, situation. And the first is, in, uh, I think, is uh, around ensuring that those involved in the delivery and build of such projects are themselves from a diverse range of back, uh, backgrounds and that these projects allow for inclusive recruitment and workplaces. And the second is centred around those who will benefit from these projects and that improving equality is at the heart of such major public investment. At, at present, there's not enough joined up thinking about how we can target our investment programmes to help mitigate specific factors relating to inequality. And whether that's the availability of affordable housing or ensure, ensuring that uh, housing is accessible, as mentioned by some of the contributions today, um, I think the uh, evidence that the committee took uh, points towards uh, very much a conversation around how capital infrastructure projects can benefit society but not necessarily contribute towards the equality agenda. Uh, we heard a lot of evidence from uh, Dr. Angelo Hagen. There were other uh, evidence <coughs> sessions, I should add, uh, over the course of this, but we received some excellent uh, contribution uh, from Dr. Hagen. And she said that, uh, gave an example of one uh, government initiative, which I think proves the point here, and that's around the Scottish National Investment Bank. And that could have been a, such an excellent opportunity uh, that as an instrument for investment by default, in its consultation, it didn't make any reference on how that institution could be mandated to address issues of equality or inequality. Now, it's easy to see how such an institution could, be, uh, it could undertake such a task. It was therefore a surprise that it wasn't. The committee said, as a result of that, that there is no systemic, uh, sorry, systematic approach to address equalities through capital inf investment projects, initiatives, or procurement. We believe the Scottish Government needs to tackle this matter urgently, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will address that in his summing up. Let's put it into context, and I think to give it some examples, uh, we had comments around how, for example, city deals uh, could go some way to improving equality around some of the specific projects that could be involved in city deal funding. And on large in infrastructure projects, such as the building of motorways, rail tracks, housing developments, what measures are in place to ensure that the workforce is just as diverse as the end user? And that also includes the workforce of contractors, which are using public money. Now, today we've heard much around the issue of mainstreaming. It comes up frequently when we talk about public policy. Uh, and in the same sense, later in this parliament, we're discussing the Islands Bill. And the, and the purpose of that really is to look at how public bodies and agencies, uh, when they make policy decisions or even policy changes, how that may or may not negatively affect islanders. What I would say is that there already is a requirement on government bodies and public bodies to do this with equalities. When individual committees of this parliament review legislation, as well as the budget, there is often an equalities and human rights section in the papers, as I'm sure we all know. But how much attention and time is really given to the subject matter if, on the face of it, the bill itself doesn't seem to directly influence or affect the equality agenda? And for that reason, the 
EHRC committee has agreed to write to all the conveners of every parliamentary committee uh, to remind them of the evidence tools available to them, uh, and I welcome that move. We also made some very specific asks of the government in this report. I don't have time to go into them in detail, but I will mention them in the hope that they will be addressed. And that's around the uh, consultation panel representing all uh, protected characteristics from which the Equality Budget Advisory Group could seek specific advice on specific issues. We asked for an update on the timescales for the independent review of the race equality framework. And as linked to my previous comments on capital investment, we've asked the Scottish Government to provide more clarification on the use of procurement as a way to address equality. Uh, what guidance is out there to ensure that tenders and contracts improve equality? The reality is that improving equality should be at the heart of every portfolio holder in government, even if it is not obvious how to do so. Uh, these debates often are filled with buzzwords like mainstreaming and ring fencing, data gathering and example setting, and all are very valid, but in my closing remarks, I think it's important that every public body, whether elected or otherwise, embeds improving equality at the heart of its policy decision making. I'd like to thank members for their input this afternoon and hope that this very thorough and detailed report by the committee helps give the government renewed focus on the wider equality agenda and the important role that government has and delivering it through everyday policy. Thank you. I call Derek Mackay for around five minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. There's been a great deal of content uh, discussed in this afternoon's uh, debate. I've agreed uh, with, with most of it, not all in its entirety, particularly around some quantum issues. But in terms of process and principles that we should follow, absolutely. I wouldn't agree with uh, Rhoda Grant's point around we're no further forward. And when devolution first started, I think all members can reflect that we've made great progress eh, on this eh, agenda eh, and indeed how we approach the budget as well. There's a great deal of international recognition from many of the policy interventions that we've made. And Christina McKelvey very helpfully took us through eh, some of that progress on this significant and auspicious um, day eh, particularly. Uh, Christina McElvey did reference budget fatigue and Patrick Harvey wants more of that as we, quite rightly, extend the kind of transparency approach in that regard. And Bruce Crawford was right to point to the budget process review group recommendations that I've accepted as to how we address some of this uh, going forward. I've benefited personally, as has the, the government corporately, and collectively from the Equality Budget Advisory uh, Group in looking at matters of process and language as well as policy content and impact uh, also. And I think uh, Angela Constant was able to touch on a number of the recommendations that they've made. Annie, Annie Wells is right, this should be a whole government approach, not just finance, not just the equality section or community section of government, but a whole government approach. And a number of members have mentioned data, but the use of data should also be proportionate. I remember the bad old days of a lot of administration and resource spent on unnecessary evaluation and monitoring, so we should be proportionate and use data intelligently that can inform our decisions and some of that's absolutely required because we haven't got the critical mass of data uh, that would allow us to understand some of the issues. So absolutely believe in that forensic approach. I'll take an intervention. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you uh, to the Cabinet for taking my intervention. Uh, I, I held an event in the Parliament last year around big data and a lot of representatives from uh, local government were there. Uh, I mean, perhaps in the, the bad old days that the, the Cabinet Secretary mentions, uh, much has changed in terms of technology and how we analyse and use data. What more is the government doing to make sure that it's using technology to properly analyse data to improve outcomes? Derek Mackay. It, it's a good uh, question. Wearing my digital public services, digital transformation hat, I could go on at great length uh, around the uh, use of data, being more creative, projects like CivTech, and uh, been able to use it as evidence to inform uh, how we design systems, be more creative rather than just coming up with a specification on a project that we think may we may um, uh, require. So there's certainly uh, much in that. But we, where we need the data is to drive our decisions and our understanding of the impact of our decisions. Gail Ross was right to mention uh, local authority uh, budgeting. Alexander Stewart focusing briefly on community empowerment I thought was very important here as well. Mary Fee on the prioritisation of uh, resources and Patrick Harvey's uh, reflections on where we are and scrutiny going forward. But when we talk about resources or even just specifically this budget, how we approached the budget around income tax, we had a very 
a deep and meaningful look at what the tax policy would mean for individuals and groups in society. And when it came to spending, just on infrastructure, for example, since Jamie Green uh, raised it, um, massive infrastructure spending on housing, for example, which we know is tackling inequality, and not just the completion of those houses, but how they're constructed um, as well, or childcare, for example, uh, which I don't think I've got time at just five minutes. I've got a little more ground I'd like to cover. Or in childcare, which is about the appropriate upskilling and training of staff, as well as the physical improvements required for that policy on improved childcare to be delivered um, as well. But the budget, of course, is the financial expression of the government's priorities and the parliament's priorities. And that's why it is so important, following on from the programme for government, eh, which expresses eh, the vision for the country and the priorities of government and parliament. But there is a, a great opportunity. A couple of members have touched upon this around the national performance framework because it's being reviewed right now. So the purpose of the government, the outcomes that we think are important, uh, the measurements by which we'll be judged on success is all up for review right now, being delivered on a cross-party basis and with key stakeholders. So there is a wonderful opportunity uh, to look at that afresh and make sure that we're tackling equality. But across a range of policy areas, I think we have shown an inclusive uh, agenda to tackle inequality. Uh, I actually agree with Mary Fee that the the happiest societies, according to all the evidence, are not necessarily the richest, but those that have tackled inequality most effectively. And, you know, I could turn to pay policy to show how in trying to do what we're doing around uh, uh, a pay uplift that is more progressive, just as tax is more progressive, is the right kind of interventions. But fundamentally, on human rights, there are a range of interventions we've been able to make. So I think we've made progress. I think we can do more. I think it's been a very helpful debate in focusing process uh, going forward. But certainly I, as Finance Secretary, working with the Community Secretary, I'm more than happy to take the suggestions that have been raised today forward uh, and report back on further progress. I call Alex Cole Hamilton to wind up the debate on behalf of the committee. Uh, around six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to echo the Cabinet Secretary's remarks about the consensual nature of this debate. I think this chamber does best when we cross party lines and recognise the shared ambition in this agenda. So in closing today's debate, I'd like to begin by thanking the members of the committee for all their hard work, all the witnesses that came before us, and indeed the never failing support of our clerks, SPICE team and other officials. Um, the focus of this report is obviously how the outcomes for people who are protected under the Equality Act of 2010 can be improved, as well as how we consider human rights, both integrated into the budget decision-making process. And I hope today has shown the dedication of our committee to pursue opportunities for improvement and to build on the significant progress which has been made to date since devolution. Now, over the past decade, Equalities has moved closer to the centre of discussions around public expenditure, and rightly so. We know the principles of equality, social inclusion and human rights are acknowledged as important Scottish Government goals and that's welcome. Nevertheless, there is always room for improvement, which the Cabinet Secretary acknowledged in her response to our report. And whilst political will is certainly there, we are still a considerable distance from the point where equal equality is uppermost in decision making and drives the budgetary process. We've also got some way to travel before we can fully measure how different sections of society are impacted by specific policies. Now, last year's report from the Budgetary Process Review Group, the commitment of the Scottish Government and the expert advice of the Equality Budgetary Advisory Group demonstrate the willingness to develop a budget process that links the national performance framework so there will be measurable outcomes. Performance budgeting is key to tracking real and measurable results. We, of course, recognise this can be challenging, but I think we all agree it's a worthwhile endeavour. So it's been a great debate. Uh, and Christina McKelvey, our convener, uh, reminded us of the importance of today as a very uh, prescient day to hold this debate. And the fact that even 100 years after the partial extension of suffrage to some women for the first time, we still have many frontiers in the equalities agenda to contend with. And she took us through the three core themes the report touches on. Her remarks were met with a comprehensive response from the Cabinet Secretary, as was comprehensive in her written response. I'm grateful to her both for her cooperation in our inquiry and the time she's taken to address the points that we uh, raise. It's important to stress, however, that just because we have the mechanisms and strata and apparatus within our decision-making progress uh, um, 
uh, processes to make equalities real. It doesn't mean that it's happening, and those measures are really as only ever as good as their application, something we always have to be consciousness as we apply each of the duties that we have set out. Gail Ross gave an excellent analysis of the distance that we still have to travel in terms of a fully human rights-based approach to both policy and expenditure. And that was a theme both picked up by both David Torrance and Mary Fee. Who referenced, she referenced in her speech the evidence of Chris Oswald, of the sometimes lip service we pay to things like the independent living rights, which is contained within the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Now, Patrick Harvey reminded us of a time when Parliament could adequately scrutinise each budget line from at least six months out, giving us the chance to close the stable door before the equalities horse had bolted, and Rhoda Grant also made some reference to the fact that there were, whilst much progress has been made, there are areas in which we have slipped backwards. Now, if I may, I'd like to make some further observations in relation to the committee's deliberations. The gap between stated policies and their satisfactory translation into funded measures has long been recognised as a feature of the disconnect between policy discrimination, uh, policy making and the resource allocation. If we are to address discrimination and inequality across society, there needs to be a joined up approach between central government, local government on delivery of national equalities priorities. Of course, acknowledging that local authorities remain autonomous bodies. And we received national policy ev um, evidence that national policy doesn't always translate into local action. And Alexander Stewart reminded us of part one of the Children and Young People's Act of 2014, which is around children's rights, which impose duties on local authorities to implement policy on that directive. However, as there was no budget line attached, the number of children's rights officers has actually halved, despite the intent of that act. And James Kelly addressed this, raising the possibility of some targeted ring fencing around the equalities agenda. In evidence to us, um, Qualities and Human Rights Commission provided another example. Previously, money had been set aside for Gypsy Traveller site development. Now they tell us, because of the concordat with local authorities and the loosening of ring fencing, such aims were not achievable without the full consent and buy-in of local authorities, which meant equalities in this area was Excuse also... me, could we have a, a wee bit hush, please, while Mr Cole Hamilton finishes on behalf of the committee? Thank you, Mr Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, Almost there. Um, so we would like to see greater cooperation between the Scottish Government and local government on these areas. Now, Annie Wells highlighted the lack of adequate data around protected characteristics, making it impossible to ensure that there was a direct line of sight between the colours, columns of the ledgers of government expenditure and the groups that they're targeted to address. In our report, we acknowledge that and the significant amount of work being undertaken by Scottish Government and the Equalities and Human Rights Commission to improve that equality evidence base. Witnesses like Danny Boyle from Bemis uh, de um, debated whether action should be focused on dealing with long-term known s systemic issues or filling identified evidence gaps through funded initiatives. There will always be competing priorities. And Jamie Green referenced Angelo O'Hagan, who gave us an amazing treatise in that example. We know many countries have followed Scotland's approach to equalities, and Derek Mackay was right to reference that. It's a central plank of this approach has been the equality budget statement, which accompanies the draft budget, and the committee recognizes significant work that goes into preparing that statement. I'd like to record its thanks. And I, will, I realize I'm over time, presiding officer, so I'll finish by saying that today's debate has brought focus on how this process should reflect the principles of equalities, social inclusion, and human rights. We welcome the government's commitment to making Scotland a more equal place to live and the contribution of statutory bodies, stakeholders, and individuals who work tirelessly to shape this progress. Equalities and human rights have to be the core business of budget making to achieve a fairer society. And as such, I commend the report of the committee and its findings to this Parliament. Thank you. That concludes the Equalities and Human Rights Committee debate on making the most of equalities and human rights levers. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business. I'll give some seconds for folks to get themselves comfortable and then we'll begin.